Peace, family. I'm R, and this is ReadyForR.com. Before we get into the video, I have to ask you, please check out UrbanHealthScience.com. A really good friend of mine by the name of Dr. Scott has debuted the Urban Health Science Initiative. The purpose for this not-for-profit organization is to have a research lab focused on the African-American health disparities we see today. So please donate Tell your friends about it. Post it on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, wherever. Share the word and donate. Now here's your featured video. We got brother Devon, Devon Pro Prospect. Yes, Prospect. Devon Prospect. Devon Prospect. <laughs> Devon Prospect. Devon Prospect. Devon Prospect. Devon Prospect. Prospect. My man George Best. You know, nutrient retention rate. So we just getting into this discussion about diet real quick. My brother said that he does a lot more than just the education aspect. He's into the health as well. And he's coming out here to, to build with Ready for R and the Aboriginal Institute. And so he wants to speak with myself and Dr. Ali on health. And so I just asked him a question on um, what his diet was like right now. So we're just going to go into his diet a little bit and I'm going to talk about a little bit of what I've been doing over the past couple of weeks since the six month um, Optimum Health Challenge has changed. Now I don't know if you can see it, but I take this shit <laughs> seriously. I'm not playing with you guys. I'm not trying to be the same George I was six months ago by the time this whole year. I, mean, I do yoga. That's what yeah, I'm about to go into. Yeah, yeah. How, how when you initially saw me here, I was doing the best jump. That's yeah, the thing exactly. I showed Inky where I was doing. <laughs> yeah. But now it's just a different, it's a, it's a type of yoga that I've created. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go too far into that right now, but it doesn't require that you build up any uh, aerobic exercise activity or anything like that. It's pretty much a stationary workout. So mm. I may go into that a little more depending on how, how we build that. Okay, so. that's interesting. All right, so I'm going to act like I'm a uh, elementary school student because I want to ask a couple of questions because, again, I've been following you all and you got a lot of important information. So um, let me ask you a question. In regards to um, diet, when you incorporate any kind of um, H2O or water supplement to your diet, um, what do you believe is the best or the optimum pH level besides the 7.36, which is supposed to be optimal? Mm. Um, if a person is healthy and they maintain their health, or if a person needs to regenerate their health, in both scenarios, what's your uh, suggestion? All right. Well, this is a really very this is a complex question, and I feel like I'm the right person to answer this. So when you're talking about pH, that has to do with what people call alkalinity. But pH doesn't directly relate to the alkalinity the way people think it is. It's not like having a high pH equates to health and having a low pH equates to health. It's actually the compounds within the water, the dissolved solids that are responsible for the chelating or the alchemical reactions that happen within water. And this is key to how your body is able to use water. So from my, from my own personal experience, what I would recommend as far as water is to have a sea salt pretty much somehow incorporated into your water with your own supplemented minerals after the water has been purified. Because if you're taking municipal water, there's a lot of compounds in there from pharmaceuticals to whatever is added in order to clean it. And they usually use chemical um, cleaners. So you're going to be absorbing all of that. Even for your skin, if you want to just shower, you pretty much want to purchase a shower filter as well. But I would say as far as the pH and the alkalinity goes, you want to know what's actually been dissolved in that water to create the alkalinity or the ability for that water to be conductive because your body needs conductive water and salt is a neurotransmitter. Sea salt is good, you don't want the chemical stuff. I mean, you can look online and find out the benefits of sea salt. You can use pink Himalayan, yes, black Hawaiian, Celtic sea salt. I use different salts for different flavors. I eat a lot. I, I consume a lot of salt. A lot of salt. And, and he's healthy. Yeah. See, that's a mis uh, people who have a miseducation and think that if you have an excess amount of salt, that it'll cause a certain amount of damage, but people don't realize that salt has a chemical makeup. And it's the makeup in the salt, especially table salt, that actually um, affects the arteries and causes a buildup of cholesterol. 
you know, Clacking correct me if I'm wrong. And so when people get the idea to think that, oh, if I just eat a lot of salt, let me stay away from that, if I have high blood pressure, you don't understand high blood pressure is more than just the salt. The salt helps contribute to it, but if you have a salt like sea salt that's natural, that can be broken down, then it's gonna be a much different ball game. You wanna pick it up. And, and even the studies that have been done to show the correlation between salt and high blood pressure, if you actually break down the study and how it was done, the amount of like table salt that was given to the mice was in excess of 500 times the amount that would be recommended. <laughs> so in any, I mean, wow, anything that's 500 times the amount is going to have drastic adverse effects. effects. Yeah, exactly. It's drastically adverse effects. But I would say that the amount of salt that I consume on a daily basis, if salt were bad for you, you I'd, I'd be a dead right heart now. attack candidate. <laughs> right. I'm definitely not a heart attack candidate. The only time I remember having issues in my heart was over 10 years ago when I was actually consuming beef and I would Every time I eat a burger, I feel that little pain there, but I was healthy. Or get like a, a spasm too, yeah, because exactly. those cause a spasm as well. And that's and then, one thing that I've noticed from people. And, people and also the aggression that comes along with eating, because you can feel the animal neurotransmitters <laughs> sending your body signals and you get beast mode. Mm -hmm. If you look at my old pictures, I was beast mode. And that was one of the things. You don't have to be taking steroids to be getting steroids. It's just the complexes that animals have for their own growth and development working inside your own life. And if you got yeast in there, it's very easy for things to you know, recombine. Mm -hmm. so that's that's how they do gen genetic modification. And that's how it happens inside your human medium too. But also, yeah, salt. So, very important. It's a neurotransmitter. It helps with synaptic, synaptic activity. It helps get things from inside the cell to outside the cell. It's very important. So salt is key. And it's also um, full of minerals, trace minerals, depending on where you get the salt from. That's what determines the color. And oh, one thing I didn't want to mention as far as salt. If you get a salt that has a sulfury smell and you're black, you don't want to consume that because there's some salts that are high in sulfur. We don't want to use the sulfur. If you find stuff like MSM sulfur that the young ladies are using to make their eyes, the brown in their eyes, lighter, just let's correlate that to the corexit that's used to, 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 to basically congeal the oil in the oceans every time we get an oil spill. So it's doing the same thing within your body, depleting your carbon and depleting your minerals. You don't want that sulfur. And parasites can definitely benefit from that as well as nitrogen. So. Yeah. So I have a second question for you. Second question, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give you good questions, right? Uh, second question is a lot of people suffer from a lack of being able to absorb what's called leaky gut syndrome, and uh, have an issue with absorption in regards to the minerals and stuff that they take in, or even kind of any kind of nutrients that they take in. What would be your best suggestion for somebody suffering from leaky gut syndrome? Mm, that's good. So leaky gut syndrome. I would have to say I learned a lot about leaky gut syndrome when I was learning about the dangers of consuming wheat and. It was said that wheat is responsible for leaky gut syndrome. You can hear about people who are wheat intolerant, they have celiac disease. But what I've come to actually find out that what's really going on, and it would take a long time for me to explain how I come to, came to these conclusions, is that there's an actual fungus that can feed off of the wheat, and the wheat doesn't break down well in the body, as well as there may be anti-nutrients within the, within the wheat. So you'll find like a lot of phytic acid in wheat, and unless it's been in such a way where the phytic acid is reduced, it creates an environment where you can't even get what your body needs to heal itself in those areas. So that's the weakened immune environment that the yeast can take advantage of. And so the yeast, kind of like it does in the ground with its hyphae, can, can burrow through different membranes within your body and then it can allow the yeast to get from your gut into your bloodstream. And that's a very dangerous state to be in. I suspect that many Americans, based on the standard American diet, have suffer from leaky gut syndrome and there are a lot there are varying symptoms for leaky gut syndrome but you can pretty much safely assume you have leaky gut syndrome if you eat like breakfast cereals that contain wheat corn things that are just hard to break down in your body but i would say that the best thing to do for leaky gut syndrome would be to treat for what's known as candida albicans overgrowth. And it's a very difficult thing to treat for. I've been treating myself with candida albicans overgrowth for over six years, and I've had a great deal of success, yet I'm not fully, um, I, don't, I still have yeast overgrowth in my body, just to be safe. I'd say I'm down to about six to 10% at this rate. So, and also I would say that your level of corruption, the level of uh, distance you have between your thoughts and where you really are in your heart has also to do with the parasite overgrowth. So I'm able to determine my level of parasite overgrowth based on the amount of mistakes I make when 
oversights that I'm missing that, that contribute to dysfunction in my life. So I look at this from a holistic perspective, whereas I look at if I make mistakes in my life, like if I leave the key in the door or, and, and forget about that, or if I don't take the garbage out and I didn't set an alarm, or if I had to speak with someone and I didn't you know, keep a date, I look at those types of dysfunctions as corruption that's associated with the level of parasite overgrowth in my body, and I try to keep tabs on myself so that I don't slip. And it's, it's very important. So that we can get turned into something that manifests as a holistic issue. So let me ask if you have a, um, for example, some people suffer from multicellular parasites that actually live in their gut. A lot of people that eat like a lot of raw sushi and things of that nature, they suffer from a lot of parasites and that can rob them of a lot of nutrients that we typically would absorb. Um, from your, you know, your intestines. So my question to you is, what would be a good means of depleting or destroying those multicellular parasites that may reside? All right. What I would recommend, first and foremost, would be a, uh, an understanding of the parasites and their life cycles. So I would recommend looking through forums, getting information from people who've been through parasite cleanses, and just kind of getting a feel for what to expect, just to prime yourself for the shock that you're going to be in once you find out about parasites. Then I would uh, recommend doing a uh, detox, but with a raw food diet as the basis for how you're going to carry out the detox. I do recommend the detox from D Health Store. There are compounds and some, there are like substances in some of the compounds. There's like hundreds of different herbs and compounds that they use that aren't the most healthy, but I would recommend a lot of them during the transition, which is the step where you have to use maybe things like phytic acid, I don't know if you've heard me say the United skin disease, but where you would use those herbal compounds that are hydrophobic to help eliminate a lot of the parasite overgrowth in the gut. And what that helps do is to free up your tissue's ability to get rid of things that may be like parasite colonies that may be in muscle tissues or in the hips if you see cellulite. That's parasite over folks. You have to deal with it and it's one of the obvious symptoms that we have. I myself didn't start getting rid of my cellulite up until I became a raw fruitarian and then stopped doing the... Um, the anaerobic activity building exercise. So when I started basically doing my yoga is when my you know, cellulite started to reduce. And that's a lot. I mean, I've been a vegetarian for six plus years and then a raw vegetarian for over two years. So you got to think about that one as far as how you're going to pace yourself mentally. So pacing yourself mentally is key. The emotional exchanges that you're going to have with yourself and the people around you when you when you make the decision to reduce parasites is also going to be a big factor. And that's why I emphasize that more so than a health you know, guru, I'm a counselor. I, I, I have my, most of my experience working with persons with mental illness, working with people who come from traumatic experiences, and I've been able to directly correlate drug abuse and traumatic experience and how people deal with coping mechanisms to different types of parasite overgrowth, as well as how these dysfunctions manifest on a physical health level, but also on a social level. So, so let me ask you a question. So why do you think it's overlooked, especially in the um, urbanist mm -hmm. community and the vegetarian community in regards to yeast? Why do you think that's such an overlooked factor as opposed to, I mean, we talk about everything else. Yeah, that's an you know excellent saying? question. But why is that so overlooked? All the research that's being done, especially in the black community and some honest um, urbanists, why do you think that that is one of the main things that's being overlooked? Well, I'll say this is so deep that I feel almost like it's too taboo to talk <laughs> too about. Too taboo. But, I, I, but I'll say it like this. We think of parasites as microscopic organisms, like we think of a colony of ants. Yet, if you look at a colony of ants and how a fungus can influence a colony of ants, you need to understand that fungus are very complex. And once they're in our bodies, they can influence our neurosynaptic activity. Now, I don't mean to cut them off. So you're referring to the ants in the rainforest. Yes. They get infected. Yeah, there you go. And then what happens is they start to have the psychotic behavior. Uh, the, the parasite is telling them to climb up the, the branch, and then they just die, and then it spores break off, and it repeats the process. So you said it. That's what's wrong with our people, and that's why we don't address the yeast issue. Because mm -hmm. when you walk by a bakery, and you've got yeast inside of you, the bakery smells darn good. Yeah. And I'll tell you, that is, I mean, that is literally the yeast in your body sending a dopamine rush mm. to your, or basically sending a signal to your synaptic activity, release dopamine to increase your probability of consuming something that it would benefit from, but you would not. So that's, 
you know, that's how important that is. And that's why it's not really been addressed. And that's one of the things that I'm, as a counselor, trying to put forward. That's why I've had to come from, you know, the health perspective is that, you know, we need to address these root issues, root issues based on, you know, the, you know what you were explaining as far as the, 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 the leaky gut syndrome, the root issues as to what's really going on. So at the, at the root of our diet, we have to look at the plants and how they grow. Plants are grown with hyphae. That's what yeast use to go through dirt and to generally to basically transfer nitrogen from the surface atmosphere to the roots of the plants. So nitrogen and yeast have a really intertwined relationship and so do roots of plants and yeast. And it also happens in us. So the things that we see yeast do to the plant kingdom also happen within the human medium as well. And you just have to make the connection between the differences between the cell membrane and the cell wall as to how you would look at how a, fun a fungus would function in a human versus something that has a cell membrane or a chitin layer or exoskeleton like a, like a ant. So when you look at the chordapsis and what it actually does to ants and it changes their exoskeleton and then you look at maybe what would happen if a yeast were in a person, you can see that the exoskeleton gets elongated, it almost blossoms. But then when you look at humans, you see three, four hundred pound humans and it looks like something out of Halo. <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask you, so do you recommend people grow their own herbs and maybe even some vegetables at home um, using like organic topsoil or something of that nature? How can you be certain to filter out the yeast that is causing the problem with the roots of the plants, etc.? I myself, I was actually dealing with a, a gentleman a few months ago with, with health and also he was trying to get me to co-sign with his topsoil industry, I guess revolution and they were they had revolutionized hyphen in such a way that they had made like a super hyphen and I said bro I cannot back you but what I do recommend is that you get your health together and maybe invest in some aquaponic and hydro hydroponic systems that, that would assist you with controlling the level of nutrients as well as the parasite overgrowth much more closely than you would if you were just to use topsoil that has pretty much been infused with various types of microorganism compounds that may not be good for us. But um, I mean, it, it, it's really deep as to how far this goes because what I would recommend is people get the best of what they can do right now. Because even right now, as far like the the nutrient retention rate is like a Armageddon survival diet. It teaches you to do more with less. So I can go days without eating, but still keep my mental faculties not suffer from fatigue. And it, it's really that you want to get to that state and reduce the amount of exposure to toxins and other compounds, like even from our clothing. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk about for the next video is like when we look at compounds that we're exposed to, it's not just from foods, but also like like polyester, nitrogen, I mean uh, polyester and um, nylon. They have uh, compounds like antimony that are used to bind colors and will bind their molecular structure that when you sweat, you start to catalyze a reaction with those heavy metals and they can leach into your skin. So you want to reduce your exposure to those types of compounds and or xenoestrogens that may be found in like spritzers, sprays, colognes, and those things that affect your olfactory system can dehydrate you, you know, on a central nervous system level. It'll work similar in your body to like, a, um, like an anesthetic. It'll make you numb to your environment. So you want to reduce things like that as well. Okay, that's good. So, uh, last question. Um, in regards to people that, because like me myself, transitioning from a multi-food diet that includes some starches, some meat on occasion, to a full vegetarian and then fruitarian <laughs> diet, um, if they're coming from the first stage into, let's say, vegetarianism, full, uh, what supplements for the things that they normally crave for, like starches and proteins that they normally get from fish and meat, what would be the best transitional, I would say, supplement that they can incorporate into their diet so that way they won't have such a cold turkey uh, rush from not having the meat and the starches? I say what I recommend in some of my consultations as far as like transitioning off meat are things like hard palms, which you can find. Um, they have the consistency of like Vienna sausages and you can do a lot with them if you strain them out and you can mix in like different syrups and different like barbecue smoke flavors if you'd like and you can make it into pretty much whatever you like. I'd recommend um, the Young Thai coconut meat. It's got the consistency of um, 
maybe a, like a fillet of a fish or something, and then maybe sometimes you can get them a little crunchier, you can get varying consistencies. But I would say people should experiment with different types of foods that are based on the fruit. Because you can dehydrate something under 110 degrees and you can still have it as the same compound and all you gotta do is rehydrate. So like a coconut or something like that. Um, if you're transitioning maybe like a dehydrated squash or something that was like lightly cooked, even bread food, stuff that you may have access to from season to season and you can adjust your palate from season to season and then just kind of reap the benefits of whatever minerals may be available. So I would say try a combination of things and then um, the heart of palms is definitely beneficial. Stay far away from any soy complexes or anything that's textured uh, vegetable proteins, anything like that. You want to stay away from any of those. What about um, quinoa or quinoa beans and stuff like that? Quinoa and beans, now, I've I spent years in my transition using beans and sprouting techniques. Beans are important so that you can release the bioavailability of some of the minerals and reduce some of the phytic acid in beans. But I would um I would transition. I would stay away from beans because they're very tasty. And they're full of starch in it, and they can feed they can feed yeast in particular in your body and make it really hard to transition. But um, there's a, these chips I used to be addicted to. They're the chipotle flavored um, benitos. And man, they are good. And I would use that with some, you know, some salsa and hummus and guacamole. And I mean, you can't go wrong with that combination. So I would. I would recommend things that you can just have as casual foods around because the transition is going to be tough. So you want things that you can just reach for and grab that you don't really have to prepare. Because when that crave hits and those parasites send a signal for that, you know, that next fix that they want, man, you might turn into a different person and you will. Your magnetic field will change, your electric potential will drop, and those parasites will have a tight hold over your actions so i would definitely i mean great questions brother it's yeah, good to be able to build with somebody who's going to ask me some of the hard questions you know what i'm saying out here yeah. oh and as far as uh you know skins and seeds yeah. yes even a kiwi you have to avoid those seeds now the thing is when you eat a seed and it fully it basically completely passes through your system it's not as bad but you don't want to take those chances when you crush up a seed and you release the internal contents it strips a lot of minerals out of your body so you really want to avoid those even with the kiwis even with the small things i mean there are extraction techniques you guys got to get more creative with it. you can take a syringe and you can extract the internals of a berry if you wanted to make something i mean i used to spend two hours preparing every meal and it was really important to me I used to sprout sunflower seeds, which is roughly you know, 24 hours. Then I would take the lecithin, the thin skin layer, off of each single one. I used to do that, so don't complain to me about how it takes 10 minutes to prepare a meal. I mean, there's people, like, I mean, I was really like a gourmet chef from back in the day, from when I had learned how to make the down home cooking for my, for my grandmother. So I, I know about, you know, grating extra sharp cheddar and then putting, you know, the layer of macaroni, you know, and milk. And then, yeah, come on, I know about all that. So, I, like, food preparation, we used to make apple pies from scratch. I used to do it all. So, and, and even when I was in the days of culturing various compounds, you know, like the kombucha the, the, the and kefir and stuff those things take time so i'm just used to spend putting love and time and effort into everything i do it shows it it's not something you really want to complain about it's something you want to start to incorporate because that level of attention to detail is what allowed me to make this amount of progress in multiple areas and i'm sure my brother with his success will be able to attest to that as well the attention to details that accounts for the progression and the growth of that. That's what we consider to be love. So you gotta put that love into your food. Right? Okay, well this is George Best and the prospect. Thank you, sir, for the information. Because I mean, one thing I learned is that, you know, you can't be so much of a teacher that you can't be a student, you know, and you can learn from anybody, even if it's not your field of study. It's always good to get information from people who's been doing it in the years. Me myself. I've been doing, um, working with herbs and uh, fruits and nutrition maybe for the past two and a half, three, about three years. So I'm still trying to sharpen in my sword on that and uh, looking at, you know, the ready for our channel and all of this information. I'm like, yeah, I got to go to somebody that's really putting it down like that. So I appreciate your time, sir. And hopefully next time I can share some, some gems with you. But for right now, I want to be a student and I'm over here learning. So George Best, my prospect. My boy ready for R on the, oh, on yeah. the camera. <laughs> and uh, we're going to see y'all another time, all right? Close up.